Hello and welcome to our lecture on political parties. We are advancing quickly through this course. It's going faster than faster and faster. So if you're not where you want to be in terms of grades or um, things like that, um, now is the time to start to course correct because your time is quickly becoming a factor. All right, but today we're going to talk about political parties. Now, what is a political party? It's a broad coalition of individuals organized to win elections in order to enact a commonly supported set of public policies. Um, hopefully you know this already, but the two big political parties in the United States are the Democrats and the Republicans. And there's a lot of other political parties too. There's the Libertarian Party, the Constitution Party, um, the Green Party. But typically, the Democrats and Republicans are the only two parties that win elections. There's a few exceptions here and there. Um, political parties are not in the Constitution. They're not mentioned anywhere in it. In fact, the founders, many of them, were concerned about political parties and hoped that we would govern in a nonpartisan way, although most of the founders ultimately ended up joining political parties later on, though. Um, three levels of parties. There's parties in the parties in the electorate, parties in government, parties as organization. Parties in the electorate is the lowest level of, of participation. This is just simply citizens who identify as a Republican or a Democrat. Parties in government, these are members of Congress and state legislatures who are Democrats or Republicans. The party as an organization is the highest level. This is the Republican National Committee and the Democratic National Committee the people whose job it is to elect the party's presidential candidates. What? Oh, we already talked about this. Domination process. Um, one of the most important roles that political parties have is that they choose the candidates for the general election. Probably know the nomination process often lasts longer than the general election. Um, you usually start out particularly for president, but also for Senate and House, too, with multiple candidates of the same party. The party then holds a primary in which they choose one of those candidates to represent the party in the general election. Um, this is, again, one of those important roles of political parties. And there are several types of, types of um, primaries. There's closed primaries. This is where a voter must affiliate with a party before casting a vote. So in other words, you have to register ahead of time as a Democrat or Republican, and then you go to the polls on primary day, and you can only vote in your party's primary. A semi-closed primary is where you can register as a Democrat, Republican, or Independent. If you're a Democrat or Republican, you can only vote in your party's primary, but if you're an Independent, you can choose which primary you want to vote in. The other kind is the open primary. This means you don't have to register at all ahead of time. You just go to the polls on primary day, and you'll be asked which primary you want to vote in, and you tell them, and they let you vote in that primary. So Democrats can vote in the Republican primary and vice versa. There's also blanket primaries, but you don't really need to worry about these because they're now defunct. Tennessee has an open primary system. There have been moves to change that in recent years, but so far it hasn't happened. All right, presidential nomination. How do we get the presidential nominees we ha we end up with? Once upon a time, small number of elites of party leadership, party machinery, chose the the uh, nominees for each party, usually in smoke-filled rooms and with little public input. Over time, though, that's become less and less the case as the nomination process has become more democratic. Um, when you go vote in the primary, you're technically not voting for the party's candidate. So in other words, you're not voting for Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton or anyone else for that matter. You're voting for delegates. Um, these delegates and the delegates you vote for are ones that have pledged to vote for the candidate of your choice. So if you're voting for Trump, you're actually voting for delegates who have promised to vote for Trump at the party convention. There are also things called superdelegates, which are not chosen through the primary process, and they get to vote however they want. You know, you probably hear when political campaign season comes, 
a lot about Iowa and New Hampshire. Why do we care about Iowa and New Hampshire? Because they're big, influential states? No, not at all. The only reason is because they're the Iowa caucus and the New Hampshire primary are the first in the nation. So whoever wins those usually gets a boost moving forward. So a lot of states would like to have that level of influence as well. You know, the presidential candidates usually go and start hanging out in Iowa and New Hampshire two years at least before the election. And, of course, states like having attention from presidents. So lots of other states have moved their primaries earlier, too, to try to force candidates to pay more attention to them. And this has resulted in Iowa and New Hampshire moving theirs earlier as well, because they always have to be first. So the effect of this is that it stretched out the primary process. I think in 2012, the first primary was held, I want to say, the first week of January. in Or first caucus, I should say, first week of January in Iowa. Who wants to go hang out in Iowa in January or New Hampshire in January? Probably nobody, but whatever. So the primary went from January all the way to July or August, much longer than the general election did. All right, let's talk about how political parties developed over time. Constitution, as we've already stated, says nothing about them, and many of the founders worried, worried they would be dangerous for the country, fear being that they would put what's the good of their people would put the good of their party over, their, over the good of the country as a whole. And you can decide for yourself if you think that has happened. Uh, Madison, James Madison, though, argued in the Federalist Number 10 that there would be lots and lots of different factions but America could sustain it because, would survive, because there would be so many different factions that if one gets out of line, the other would kick them back in. Um, in his farewell address, George Washington warned Americans against entangling alliances and against the dangers of factions or political parties. I think it's safe to say we ignored Washington's advice on both counts. Maybe, maybe we'd be better off, we would have been better off if we'd listened. Maybe. All right. Going back in time, Constitution, before the Constitution was ratified, we have the first proto political parties, um, the Federalists and the Anti Federalists. Now, these were not political parties in the sense they exist today. Um, they were just basically two group, um, group, two separate groups who had different ideas about the Constitution. The Federalists wanted to ratify. The Constitution without a Bill of Rights. The Anti-Federalists wanted to include a Bill of Rights. Um, Federalists were, were people like Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, John Jay, John Adams. The Anti-Federalists were people like Thomas Jefferson and Patrick Henry. Ultimately, the Bill of Rights was added to the Constitution, and both sides agreed to ratify it. So ultimately, this was reconciled. So we get a new Constitution. We get a new political system. And it's not long before we have the first political parties emerge. The first political national political party in American history was the Federalist Party. And this was founded by Alexander Hamilton, who at the time was George Washington's Secretary of the Treasury. And the Federalist Party favored a strong central government. They favored a national bank. And they generally represented urban interests and business interests. And in the 1790s, they favored Britain over France. Um, so the Federalist Party's vision of America was that America should be a country of cities, of commerce, of capitalism, of industry. Uh, of course, not everybody's thrilled about this. Um, in response, the Republicans or Democratic Republicans are founded by Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. And they're pretty much the opposite. Their vision of America is a country of small farmers, of rural agriculture. Um, they, they oppose a national bank. They favor states' rights over a strong central government. They represent farmers and rural interests. They're skeptical of big business. So their vision of America is a rural agrarian society. The Federalist Party's vision of America is an urban industrial society. And you can kind of see that this debate over what America should be is one that's still going on now, and these are roughly what divides the Democrats and Republicans today. Of course, the Federalist Party ultimately dies out in the 18-teens, and the Democratic-Republicans 
become the dominant party. This is called the era of good feelings. Um, the um, should mention the Democratic Republic. The Republicans evolved into a political party we have today. Can you guess which one? Ha! Trick question. They evolved into the Democratic Party of today. Today's Republican Party comes later, but we'll get to that. All right, so the Federalists die out in the 18-teens. But their ideas and their vision of America does not. So it's inevitable that a new party is going to rise to represent people that urban interests and commerce and all that. Um, the Democratic Republicans, though, in 1824 split into four factions. And John Quincy Adams is ultimately awarded the presidency over John, over Al, over Andrew Jackson, in spite of the fact that Adams lost the popular vote and failed to win a majority of electoral votes. In fact, Al, um, Andrew Jackson won more electoral votes than Adams did. So how did Adams become president, you ask? Well, the Constitution says in order to become president, you have to win a majority of the electoral votes. A majority is defined as half plus one. So I think Jackson had 45% of the electoral votes and Adams had 37%, I believe. I'd have to look that up. Not really that important. But it was less than half, which means that the House of Representatives chooses the president. And they chose Adams. And Adams immediately named Henry Clay to be his Secretary of State. Clay was Speaker of the House at the time, which looks sketchy. Um, Jackson immediately denounces what he calls the corrupt bargain, goes back to Tennessee and starts campaigning for 1828. Um, there's no evidence that this was a corrupt bargain. Adams probably just appointed, appointed a Henry because he thought he was best person for the job, but he was fully qualified for it, but it, it looked bad. 1828, Jackson runs again against Adams on the ticket of the Democratic Party. Um, this party is roughly what the Democratic Republicans before had been, although maybe a little more extreme. They were the party of the common man, of rural interest, rural values, also populism, this idea that we should appeal to average people. Main selling point for, point for Jackson is he was a poor boy who worked his way up. Adams was rich, pampered, elite, spoiled. He doesn't understand average people. Jackson does. Um, Jackson wins easily in 1828. In response to that, Jackson's opponents form a new political party called the Whig Party. And the Whigs pick up roughly where the Federalists had left off. They're the party of cities, of urban interests, of commerce, of trade. And they manage to elect... Their most prominent members are going to be people like Henry Clay and William Henry Harrison. They were sort of a coalition between northern industrialists and southern plantation owners. Ultimately, slavery is going to destroy them in the 1850s because the Whigs aren't able to come to any kind of agreement on the issue, so they're going to split apart and die out, but be replaced by a new political party called the Republican Party. Republicans were founded in 1854 or 1855, depending on which origin story you, uh, you accept, as an anti-slavery party, mostly consisting of former Whigs, Free Soilers, and anti-slavery Democrats. And some were abolitionists, some were or different degrees to the extent they opposed slavery and different reasons for it, but anti-slavery abolition was the issue that united them all. In 1856, they nominate their first presidential candidate, a guy named John C. Fremont. In 1860, they nominate Abraham Lincoln, and he is the first Republican to be elected president. Also in 1860, they exp expanded their party's platform, went from, remained anti-slavery, but it also became the party of northern industry, improvements in infrastructure, and tariffs. So it became more or less the new Federalists. And from 1860 to 1932, the Republicans are going to absolutely dominate. Um, there's going to be 15 presidents during that time period. 12 are Republicans, 3 are Democrats. And even that's a little misleading because one of the Democrats was Andrew Johnson, who was elected on the ticket with Lincoln as a Republican. So this is a period of Republican dominance up until FDR, actually. 
reason for this, the Republicans were the party seen as the party on the right side of the Civil War. Democrats have been the party of the Confederacy and of slavery. The Republicans were the party of the Union. The Republicans elect several Civil War veterans president, beginning with Grant in 1868 all the way up to McKinley in 1896. This was called, the critics called this waving the bloody shirt. Never let the public forget that they had been the on the right side of the Civil War. Now, in the 1890s and early 1900s, there were several minor third parties. Um, one was the Populist Party, which was found, also known as the People's Party, which was founded in 1887. It consisted of poor white cotton farmers in the South and wheat farmers in the West. It was Jeffersonian in the sense that it was anti-banks, anti-railroads, pro-agriculture, anti-elites, and was opposed to the gold standard. 1896, it endorsed the Democratic Democratic um, nominee, William Jennings Bryan. Bryan gave his famous Cross of Gold speech at the 1896 Democratic Convention in which he you won't crucify us on a cross of gold. It was anti anti gold standard. Ultimately, died out after 1896. The Progressive Party in 1912 no, um, nominated Teddy Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt had already been president for two terms, from 1901 to 1909, but he left office in 1909, leaving handing the presidency over to his VP William Howard Taft. But Taft ended up being much more conservative than Roosevelt wanted, so Roosevelt attempted to win the Republican nomination from him in 1912. Ultimately, though, Taft was able to keep the Republican nomination, so Roosevelt said, screw you guys, I'm going home. He jumped over to a third party, the Progressive Party, and ran in 1912. And he came in second in that election. Taft has the dubious distinction of being the only Democrat or Republican ever to come in third place in a presidential race. However, the fact that Taft had kept and managed to win the nomination away from Roosevelt um, ensured that the conservatives would remain in charge of the Republicans. Had Roosevelt actually won, Roosevelt was a liberal by 1912, it could be today that the Republicans are the liberal party and the Democrats are the conservative party. So that's kind of a... a um, underappreciated primary, I guess you could say. Um, Roosevelt's most well-known in 1912, though, for giving a famous speech in which he was shot in the chest, and Roosevelt being Roosevelt, finished the speech. But Progressive Party doesn't win, but they do succeed. They get a number of constitutional amendments in the 19-teens passed for their agenda. They get an income tax. We get um, direct election of senators. We get women's suffrage, and we get prohibition. So, although the Progressive Party didn't win the presidency, they did succeed in getting many parts of their agenda enacted. All right, party loyalty and patronage. Going back to our guy, John Quincy Adams, when he was president beginning in, in 1825, he gave government jobs based solely on qualifications. He didn't care what your personal politics were. And this seems like a good way to do it, a fair way to do it, but it doesn't work. And here's why. You need people who agree with your vision and what you want to do. If you're giving jobs to people who don't, then they're going to be pulling in an opposite direction as you. And this is simply not going to work. Uh, when Andrew Jackson was elected in 1828, he changed this. He appointed his supporters to government positions. Spoils system, it was called. If you wanted to work in the Jackson administration, you had to have, there were two prerequisites you had to meet. One, you had to be a loyal Democrat. And two, you had to have supported Andrew Jackson. <coughs> of course, this is problematic as well because it leads to corruption. And by the late 1800s, we have what are called political machines. And these were common in big cities. These were party systems who were dominated by a boss who control, controlled the distribution of public jobs and commanded groups of voters who would vote for their preferred candidates, almost like the mafia. All right, late 19th century saw a number of reforms. Um, we have a merit-based system of government employment, ballot reforms, etc. We'll talk more about this when we talk about the bureaucracy. Let's talk about the two-party system. Candidates, in order to win the Democratic primary, you typically have to run to the left. 
and or otherwise be liberal. In other words, be liberal. To win the Republican primary, you have to run to the right or be conservative. But you can't run too far to the left or to the right and then win the general election because in the general election, you have to move back towards the middle. So you want to, if you're, say, a Republican, you want to win over all the conservative voters plus enough moderates to win. If you're a Democrat, same with the left. If you're forced to move too far to the left or right, getting back to the middle can be a problem. Um, classic example of this would be 2012. Mitt Romney got called on tape basically saying 47% of Americans are lazy and losers. Um, you can't really say that and expect to win those votes, right? Their votes. And if you want to get elected president, you kind of have to. So that ended up hurting him. Um, typically, the result of this is we don't typically get extreme <clears throat> candidates in the general election, although maybe there maybe there's exceptions to this. Um, the two-party system is partly created by the Electoral College. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in order to become president, the Constitution says you have to get a majority of electoral votes. And if you have three candidates running, it's going to be rare that one candidate is going to get 51% of electoral votes. Typically, it would if it's like the current system is now, you'd probably have three candidates starting out with 30% of the vote each, and then you'd have about 10% that's undecided, and that would settle it, which effectively would mean the Electoral College would never choose the president. The House of Representatives would choose the president, and the Senate would choose the vice president, because that's what happens when nobody wins half plus one of the electoral votes. So Electoral College is partially responsible for our two-party system. Now, does that mean third parties are useless. No. It is true that third parties typically don't win. It's very rare that they do. However, they can be influential. Um, for example, anti-slavery was first on the Free Soil Party and the Liberty Party. Ultimately, when those parties started winning 10% winning, uh, of the vote or more, the other parties had to recognize this was now a powerful force. Um, we mentioned Teddy Roosevelt already. He lost in 1912, but his progressive reforms, ultimately, many of them ultimately ended up getting enacted. Prohibition Party never won a national election, but they did make prohibition a reality in the 1920s. So, um, in 1992, Ross Pro ran as an independent and got 19% of the vote. He ran on a platform opposed to NAFTA and opposed to the federal deficit. He may have cost George H.W. Bush the election. The Republicans responded. They realized that if we want to win next time, we have to win back those voters. So they started pushing at that time for a balanced budget. By the late 90s, we actually had a balanced budget in this country, which is hard to imagine today. Um, so third parties can have an impact, although in the short term, they oftentimes have the opposite of what they intend. So in 2000 election, for instance, Bush beats Gore, probably because Ralph Nader siphoned some votes away from Gore. It's hard to imagine anyone who voted for Gore would have chosen Bush as their second, as their second choice. Everybody, so if Nader had been on the ballot, probably those votes would have gone to Gore, and he probably would have won. So they can have the opposite effect in the short term. In the long term, though, if a third party gets five percent of the vote or more then the other parties have to look at why those 5% voted for that party and try to win them over. In other words, if you are if you lose the election by 2% of the popular vote and you see a third party candidate got 5%, you're probably going to want to win those 5% back over so that you can maybe win the next election. All right, let's talk about the parties we have today. Although the Democratic Party can be traced Back to Andrew Jackson and Thomas Jefferson. Probably today's Democratic Party owes more to Franklin Roosevelt. Um, Roosevelt was elected in 1932 during the Great Depression on the platform of a new deal, of getting the economy moving again, using federal power to create jobs, get people working again, make things better. Um, there had been depressions before in American history. In 1893, there was the there was a depression and. Grover Cleveland, who was president at the time, said, hey, I know this sucks, but don't look to the government for help. <coughs> it's not the federal government's job to create jobs. And he vetoed 
numerous bills that would have provided um, welfare or relief to people in need because he thought it wasn't the federal government's job. It's hard to imagine a president saying that or doing that today. Roosevelt's view was we're going to use the power of the federal government to get the economy moving again. And so for this idea that government can do good for people, this is kind of a democratic idea today. Um, of course, not everybody's thrilled about this. More conservative people thought you're expanding the reach of the federal government too much. Um, going into the 1960s, Lyndon Johnson oversaw and signed the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65. Also oversaw the Great Society programs, which were in some ways an extension of the New Deal. Programs like Medicare, Medicaid, Job Corps, um, the food stamp program. Um, the New Deal, I should mention, included things like Social Security. So this sort of solidified the Democrats as the party of, um, of using government to help people in need. Also, the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65 won over the Af African American voters for the Democrats as well. Roosevelt did that to some extent, too. In 1930, it's, people forget, but for about... 70 years, African Americans overwhelmingly voted Republican. And in 1932, Herbert Hoover actually won African American voters over Franklin Roosevelt. But 36, Roosevelt carried African American voters, and the Democrats have won majority of African American voters in every presidential election since then. In the 60s, though, still 40% of African Americans voted Republican. After that, though, they switch more overwhelmingly to the Democrats. Um, Nixon ran in 68 on what was called a Southern strategy, which was a backlash against what was seen as the um, excesses of the, uh, of the 1960s. Um, law and order, we're going to return to traditional values. Remember, the 60s is a time of great upheaval. You got the civil rights movement. You got the feminist movement. You got drugs. You got more openness about sex. You've got um, Woodstock, a controversial music. It's a pretty, pretty turbulent time, particularly if you're a traditionalist. And Nixon appealed to traditionalists. Law and order, we're going to return to traditional values. We're not pro-racism, but we are going to crack down on some of the more militant aspects of the civil rights movement. We're going to call for a limited government, and we're going to appeal to traditional blue-collar voters. And this is when the South begins to shift away from the Democratic Party into the Republican Party. All right, so if, like, as similar to the Democrats, the Republicans can be traced all the way back to Lincoln, although today's Republican Party probably owes more to Ronald Reagan. There had been earlier Republican presidents in the 20th century, Eisenhower and Nixon, for example, but they weren't really particularly conservative. They were moderates. Um, Reagan's elected in 1980, and he runs on a pro-life, pro-evangelical, lower taxes, limited government um, platform coupled with an aggressive foreign policy, which is basically still the platform of the Republicans today. Um, he appealed to what were called Reagan Democrats, Democrats in places like the South or Pennsylvania or Ohio, who were blue-collar Democrats, traditionalists, who shifted because they thought the Democratic Party was out of touch with them. Same voters may have swung the election to Trump in 2016. All right, is there a difference between Democrats and Republicans? The answer is absolutely. Um, Democrats and Republicans in Congress are more divided than ever before. used to be pretty common that there were liberal Republicans and conservative Democrats. Now there's virtually none in, of either of those in Congress, and there's very few moderates even. Um, over 90% of votes in Congress are party line, meaning that nearly all Republicans are on one side and nearly all Democrats are on the other side. Um, party loyalty, though, has declined among American voters, about a third of Americans identify as independents, although this is a little misleading. A lot of people who identify as independent actually lean towards one party or another. Um, think parties are going to go away? The answer is probably not. They've been with us almost since the beginning, so I doubt it. Every year we hear is the year of the third party. Don't bet on it. Maybe I'd be wrong about this, but Third party has never won the presidency, and I don't foresee that happening in the near future. The only thing that could possibly happen would be one of the two political parties collapses and goes away. If that happens, then a new party would come and take their place. But I don't see like a third permanently having a three parties. 
All right, differences in modern Democrats and modern Republicans. Modern Democrats more likely to be live in cities, more likely to be minorities, lower income, more likely to be women. FDR is a standard bearer. Um, go away. Sorry about that. Um, viewed as big spenders. Republicans are more conservative, slightly fewer members, though not not um, substantially fewer. Tend to be pro-business, uh, more powerful in rural areas smaller role for government, tend to be more traditionalist in their religion and their outlook. All right, and that is all for political parties. As always, if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I will see you back here next time. Have a good day.